So I'll start anyways. Uh, I hope that I'll get you awake with this talk. I'm Ratnadeep Devnath. I'm known as RTN Pro. Sorry, at Zapier, I contribute to open source and mentor new people uh, get started with open source contributions. I'm also a Bhakti Yoga practitioner. And I work remotely from a place called Mayapur, which is uh, 130 kilometers from Kolkata in West Bengal, India. Uh, yeah, where the world's biggest temple is coming up. So to start with, I'd like to set some context for this talk uh, so that you can relate to this talk better. As I said, I work at Zapier. So what do we do at Zapier? At Zapier, we help you connect your apps and automate workflows. You can connect apps that you use every day uh, and do some cool stuff. Uh, for example, you can write a Zap or a workflow which uh, will check your inbox for new messages arriving and if it has an attachment, you can upload the attachment to Dropbox and you can send that Dropbox link to Slack. Uh, uh, you can automate similar other cool workflows in your life. And you can do that using our cool web editor without writing a single line of code. So what is Zapier under the hood? Uh, we are a Python Django work, uh, workshop. Uh, we run more than 10 million tasks a day to automate all the workflows for you. We have around like 250 application servers that talk to our databases. And we need to scale up to cater to the new users joining our platform. So we won't win any awards for our application architecture. It's plain vanilla. We have got multiple application servers running multiple workers. We have got RDS, we, uh, for database we use RDS MySQL. Uh, it has a single master and multiple replica setup. Uh, the app servers connect to primary for read write and they connect to multiple replicas for intensive reads. However, this uh, uh, model has got some shortcomings. Our apps end up making too many database uh, connections uh, uh, to the DB. And we tried Django connection pooling, um, but it was not enough. It doesn't scale beyond a single process. What we talk about multiple servers. Uh, even with Django pooling, we ended up in situations where our applications would make too many connections to the database, and MySQL really doesn't like uh, a lot of connections to the DB. Uh, and we had a threshold, like around over 6,000 connections, our DB would start stalling down, and then things go spiraling down, and this caused uh, in uh, downtimes at peak hours, which is not that great. So far we had uh, used duct typing uh, to get around this problem. Uh, whenever we hit some limits to scale up RDS MySQL instances, uh, one approach is uh, adding more replicas to handle more reads, uh, but uh, for us the master is also a bottleneck and we have only a single master. If we if we cannot solve this by adding replicas, yeah, we hit a button in AWS, scale up RDS, pay some additional dollars and get away for some time, but not forever. This has limitations. It cannot go forever. Uh, we are limited by the hardware that is available in a, a particular AZ of AWS. This also has increased cost. Uh, yeah, it's cost prohibitive. So what now? We started with the vision that uh, we want to hit 10x scale without 10x cost. We considered AWS Aurora, but it is still limited by a single master, and it involved some re-architecture, and we did not want to do that at that point of time. So what would be an ideal solution for us? So we started looking for a global database proxy uh, with a good and efficient connection pool, something that works across multiple servers, not just a single process. So we started looking the ecosystem for available solutions. First, we hit some proxies uh, like Nginx, HProxy, but soon <coughs> we realized that they are just proxies. Uh, they are not database aware, and they do not have connection pooling. What you, what you needed? Then we hit MariaDB MaxScale. It is database aware, which is good news for us. It has connection pooling something we want. Uh, however, it is not aware of transactions. We just kind of let down because we need support for transactions. And it doesn't support query-based routing. So what do I mean by query-based routing? 
So you can define rules uh, like that, like uh, uh, route all the read traffic, for example, select queries to your replicas and route all the write queries to the primary database. You cannot do that with uh, MariaDB max scale. And above that, it is proprietary. Uh, and at Zapier, we prefer using open source applications as, as long as possible. Then we hit uh, upon uh, proxy SQL. It is database aware, like its earlier counterpart. Um, it supports connection pooling. It is transaction aware, so it understands database transactions. Good news for us. Uh, it also supports query-based routing. And on top of that, it's open source. Win-win for us. So our choice, the title of the talk, is obviously Proxy SQL because it is featureful, it is uh, transaction aware, it supports connection pooling, it's open source. I told you that before. On top of that, it has got an awesome community. So Proxy SQL is not developed by a single person or a single organization. There are collaborators from various organizations. They have a, an active GitHub issue list, uh, pull requests, and active mailing list. You get support from all these uh, channels. And also on top of that, there is a community around it like various DB consulting firms like uh, Percona, several lines. They support Proxy SQL and they have generated awesome content around Proxy SQL with benchmarks, good blogs, how to set up Proxy SQL efficiently. So we feel that like uh, with this awesome community, we are at good hand with Proxy SQL. So how does Proxy SQL really work? So Proxy SQL sits uh, between your application servers and your database. So your application servers, as notorious as they are, they can uh, spawn like around thousand connections, thousands of connections to Proxy SQL. And Proxy SQL just maintains a few hundred connections to the database and does intelligent multiplexing so that it can deliver the throughput with uh, having less uh, load on the database. So how do you get started with Proxy SQL? You install Proxy SQL in, using your distributions package manager. It's available in most distributions. Uh, you dump a, uh, prox a big uh, Proxy SQL CNF in Etsy Proxy SQL CNF. I'll go through the important parts here. So you can configure your backend database servers using MySQL servers. You can configure uh, users uh, that Proxy SQL will use to connect to your backend databases and the user that uh, the applications will use to connect to Proxy SQL. And then you can define some query rules. Uh, you can define port-based query, query rule, which is the easiest to get started with, but you can also write user-based query rule. You can also write um, query-based uh, query rule. Uh, so you can have a lot of options here. And then you start Proxy SQL. Once you start Proxy SQL, you also have the option to update your configuration live without restarting Proxy SQL. That means when, you're, when you have to update configuration for Proxy SQL, for example, like configure new backend DBs for it, you don't have any downtime. So uh, if you search about Proxy SQL on the internet, you'll uh, end up finding a lot of articles about good benchmark, good numbers uh, uh, generated by the community on it. But uh, before taking things to production, we wanted to try things for ourselves. So we use a tool called Sysbench uh, to run benchmarks on Proxy SQL. So Sysbench is a cool tool which can uh, throw like thousands of concurrent connections to your database uh, and put it under load and uh, generate some metrics out of that. So we ran the tests in multiple modes. We ran it in read-only mode. We ran it in read-write mode across two scenarios. Like one time there was a database which was a small RDS instance. Uh, directly we hit the database directly. And in another case we hit the database via Proxy SQL. And then we recorded the metrics. Uh, these are the metrics for record. Uh, I'll uh, analyze it further here. So if we compare the uh, like above metrics, so we see that in case of latency, Proxy SQL has around like 10% higher latency than direct access to database. That is expected to use another layer on top of the database. Um, in terms of QPS, transactional, uh, Proxy SQL is again having 10% less performance. Uh, then direct access to database. In case of other uh, 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 like queries, uh, the QPS is again uh, around like 10% less than uh, direct access to database. But the interesting thing to note here is that while the, um, uh, in case of the direct access to database, we had 100 concurrent co connections hitting the database. In case of Proxy SQL, we had 100 concurrent connections to prox hitting Proxy SQL from applications. But Proxy SQL maintained very less number of connections to the database. 
In case of read write, we had one tenth of the connection. Proxysql just had 10 connections for 100, uh, like mu handling multi 100 connections. And in case of read write, it had 20 connections, one fifth of the total number of connections that came from the application. So, we see that Proxysql is able to deliver almost like 90% of the performance with maintaining one tenth uh, or one fifth of the connections to the database, which is a great number. It gives you enough room to scale on top of your current database setup on top of single master. Proxysql has got a number of advantages or there's something else. Let's see. How much can it multiplex? The upstream claims that Proxysql it quick uh, in a particular way can scale uh, like uh, multiplex indefinitely, but there are some gotchas to that. You don't want higher t uh, like latencies on connection initializations. So based on our benchmarks and uh, tests in our staging and production, for us 10x, uh, like easy, we had like easily 10x gains for read queries and 5x gains for write queries. These are like pretty good numbers for us. Proxysql claims and boasts about zero downtime configuration update. That means that you can add backend databases or replace backend databases without restarting your app and without restarting Proxysql. That means there will be no downtime. But it really sounds too good to be true. So, as skeptics we are, like we decided to write our own tests uh, and assert this. We had to write this because uh, the docs did not say that it has zero time, uh, zero downtime live update, but it did not have examples or explanations on that. So we're kind of like in doubt. So we wrote our own tests. So in this link, you can find the test that we wrote to assert this. And what he found was really cool. So whenever you replace an existing uh, backend server from Proxysql and replace it with a new one, so Proxysql lets the in-flight transactions complete rather than killing them right away. And for the newer transactions that arrive, it starts routing the uh, transactions to the new database. So you do not end up losing any transaction, in-flight transactions during this live update. Uh, seems good. We use Django. So we wanted to uh, assert that whether how well Proxysql plays with Django and basically the Django ORM. So what works with Django? Uh, typical read write works well. Uh, Django performs transactions using a set auto commit zero and set auto commit one blocks. Uh, it is not a typical way to do transactions. DBS don't like that. Proxysql did not support that earlier, but then on the basis of uh, requirement by the community, they eventually uh, added up ad adding a parameter in the config which enables us to support treat set auto commit zero and one blocks as transactions. So you can set MySQL auto commit false as transaction to, uh, to true to enable uh, identify uh, auto commit zero as transactions. So what it does is that like it disables multiplexing during transactions so that your connection in a transaction won't end up in multiple uh, uh, backend database connections. And you can use port based routing to get started with, uh, like uh, in Proxysql to get start, uh, started with using Proxysql with Django without any code refactor. What doesn't work? Uh, officially documented save point queries or nested transactions do not work with Proxysql. Um, long living connections uh, from application do not work that well. Uh, so if you have application pooling, you might consider disabling that or like tweaking the timeouts. Uh, sorry, the time uh, till the database connections are alive. So at Zapier, we, and I think in many organizations, you will be using safe points like nested transactions. Uh, you want to do a partial commit and then roll back if necessary or like commit. So it is very key to getting live with Proxysql and this was like a blocker to go to production. Uh, so it is not officially uh, supported, but we had a hypothesis that since all the transactions are wrapped, uh, like all the safe points queries are wrapped inside auto commit zero and one blocks in Django, and since Proxysql disables multiplexing in that uh, period, it might work, uh, work. So it was just a hypothesis. So again, we started writing some tests and we found that it works in certain cases. So safe point works when it is encapsulated with auto commit zero and auto commit one blocks so that we can treat it as a, as a transaction. And we need to turn another value, uh, MySQL enforce auto commit on reads to true to get this working with various isolation levels. So in our initial test, it did not, even with safe point, 
uh, encapsulated inside AutoCommit, it did not work for uh, repeatable reads TX isolation levels, but with this value set, it works from uh, like, uh, uh, like read committed and repeatable reads quite well. Uh, and proxy signal needs to have as many backend connections to handle a concurrent, uh, uh, the co concurrent transactions that are hitting proxy SQL. So if you have 100 concurrent uh, transactions uh, hitting your proxy SQL, you need to have 100 backend connections ready uh, to handle that because multiplexing is disabled during that time. So if you kind of like over provision proxy SQL a bit by say 100 few more backend connections, it should pretty, work pretty well. And here is the source code of our, uh, like the Django process SQL demo and tests that we did. You can refer to that later. So once we are happy that we can go uh, in production with process SQL, um, we uh, started planning our deployment strategy. So when it comes to deployment strategies, there are uh, multiple ways you can deploy process SQL. So you have got one approach which is application sidecar. Do not confuse sidecar with the container world. However, the meaning is something similar. Uh, centralized cluster. So a sidecar approach looks like uh, this. Uh, you have got proxy SQL running alongside the application on the same host. Uh, and the uh, application talks to the local proxy SQL server and uh, the proxy SQL talks, all these individual proxy SQLs talks to the databases separately. It has got some advantages, some disadvantages. So, uh, since the proxy SQL uh, resides on the same host, there's little latency between application and proxy SQL, so uh, hardly any la network latency, so the access is fast. And the load on proxy SQL server running on uh, each node is less. The disadvantages of this would be, like it's a pain to maintain uh, such a setup in a traditional deployment model using EC2 Ansible Packer. Uh, uh, However, it's quite simple to do it in the Docker world with Kubernetes, but yeah, uh, that's how it is. Monitoring so many instances of proxy SQL is pain, even understanding what failed and what not uh, is painful. Even maintaining proxy SQL instances deployed across say 250 application servers is a, is a painful process. So there's a second approach like centralized cluster where you have got a highly available proxy SQL uh, setup running between an application and uh, uh, database and the applications connect to this cluster and, pro uh, and the proxy SQL cluster talks to the database. The advantages of this uh, approach are like it's easy to maintain, it's easy to monitor, it's a single uh, set of uh, few nodes that you have to monitor and maintain. However, the disadvantages are, now you, uh, you introduce a network between your application and uh, proxy SQL nodes and this has an added uh, latency because of network. And if you put an ELB in front of that to load balance uh, traffic, uh, you, you will have a few milliseconds of higher latency. And it also creates like, uh, since it's a central cluster, it creates higher load on proxy SQL unlike the previous approach where the load on proxy SQL was less. Does it, is, is, is it a disadvantage? Seems like, it sounds like it, but, Proxy SQL shines the brightest when it's under load. This is a benchmark generated by the Percona folks, which shows that with increasing number of connection threads from the application to the database or proxy SQL, the throughput increases to a particular point, and after that, the performance starts degrading, the throughput decreases in case of databases. But you see that in case of proxy SQL, it reaches a plateau after like 200 threads. And this is how uh, you want to, uh, like systems at scale to behave. You do not want the performance to degrade with increasing load. And proxy SQL maintains an average performance even after uh, that particular threshold, whereas direct access to database just drops drastically. So our choice was obviously a centralized proxy SQL cluster because it's more performant and it's easy to maintain and monitor. So no deployment is complete with the monitoring. Uh, so we also implemented monitoring for proxy SQL. Our monitoring story uses Datadog, and this is a snapshot of the Datadog uh, dashboard we use for monitoring proxy SQL. We're monitoring key metrics for proxy SQL like network traffic, the number of CPU cores it is using, um, uh, the number of, uh, uh, the, uh, the amount of memory it is using, the number of kind of client connections it is handling per node. Um, 
the number of connections that are in use, the number of free uh, connections you have in your pool, so that you can know that uh, is uh, do you need to like are you good enough? Like do you have enough connections to handle any connection uh, traffic spike? And it shows you average latency. Uh, yep. So proxy SQL, how do you do monitor proxy SQL? Proxy SQL has got a, a database from uh, where it dumps metrics. It's the stats DB. So you need to write your some custom script to scrape the metrics from that and push to your favorite monitoring tool. Uh, we, uh, this is the link for the script that you use to monitor proxy SQL. And this is a, below is the link of the wiki uh, where it talks about what metrics is for what. So you can go into that and like figure out what metrics you might need. Now it comes to logging. Yeah, we also need logging for any production system. The uh, logging story with Proxy SQL is a bit uh, dicey, as in like it doesn't support out of the box uh, logging integration with uh, frameworks like Gray, Gray Log, uh, Logstash. It does basic logging to STD out, which is not that useful. Proxy SQL does support query logging. It's helpful during uh, debugging, uh, but we have disabled it in production anyways. Uh, but it's in binary format and you cannot make sense out of that much. Uh, you need additional tools to make sense out of uh, the binary query logs. However, uh, some folks from Zendex, they are implementing a working on a pull request which will enable support for JSON based query logging so that you can uh, route it to other uh, log aggregators. For us, we just rely on some application uh, logs which uh, kind of tell us about like some operational errors that we get from Proxy SQL and we have set up alerts for that so that they can act whenever there is something like that. So failure is a uh, like, uh, like thing that might happen anytime, anywhere, so you have to be ready for failures. And Proxy SQL is no exceptional system, it has got failures. Uh, one kind of failure that you might get is that like when your Proxy SQL node dies, uh, how does the application react to that? So you can get around that by uh, setting up a highly available proxy SQL cluster so that it's not a single point of failure. So you can handle one node going down. And you can also set up a graceful shutdown of proxy SQL so that uh, the connections are not killed in flight. So proxy SQL has enough time to uh, like complete the existing uh, connections that is handling and then close uh, it uh, gracefully. You get, then uh, when you start using proxy SQL, you might get this uh, error in the few, uh, first few days that max timeout connect, uh, max connect timeout reached while reaching host group. So this does not come due to proxy SQL. So MySQL is really bad at handling connection spikes. So it takes really time to create new connections. So whenever uh, there's a connection spike in your application, say you just started proxy SQL and there's a, uh, like you uh, enable proxy SQL on all apps and they all start connecting to proxy SQL, so MySQL will choke up creating connections and then proxy SQL will start throwing this error to you. One way to get around that is that you can increase the uh, parameter value like for MySQL connect timeout server max so your clients can wait for longer time but I do not see it as a, as a feasible way. I do not want to have this value more than 10 seconds. Uh, so uh, yeah, that is, you can do configure this up to a limit but not much. Uh, however, uh, you can, Enable one feature called like uh, MySQL free connections percentage. It's what it indicates that once proxy SQL opens the connection, how much percentage of the connections does it keep in the pool free? Uh, so that it can directly handle that to the app whenever there's a need. So we set that to a higher value because uh, we want our proxy SQL to be ready for handling new connections. And you can also do one thing is that you can slowly ramp up traffic to proxy SQL or you can have some script that actually warms up traffic, uh, like warms up proxy SQL so that it has got enough connection in the pool and then route application traffic to proxy SQL. Then there's one uh, common failure that you might face in MySQL or uh, uh, in proxy SQL as well that MySQL server has gone away. That means that uh, an application establishes a connection to the backend database. Uh, and it is a long-lived connection and in, in between the connection dies and the application doesn't know and it still tries to do a query and then it gets this operational error that MySQL server has gone away. So what you can do is that the uh, first proxy SQL is an efficient connection pooling. So you, there's no uh, need to have, again, application side connection pooling. It's quite efficient, we have seen that. Uh, so you can either disable connection pooling in your application or you can have a small, uh, like uh, you can keep your database connections alive for a small time, say 15 seconds. For us, 15 seconds works very good for us. Um, and you can shut down or rotate proxy SQL more gracefully. Like you can, whenever a shutdown signal comes to proxy SQL, rather than killing proxy SQL, you can handle the signal 
you can wait for some time uh, so that uh, some time which is greater than all your uh, b the time for each your database connections live and you can wait for proxy SQL to clean up uh, like uh, close uh, like gracefully close all the connections and then kill proxy SQL. And then there's another uh, error that he faced uh, when he just went live uh, uh, last week in production is that like too many connections. So it happens uh, when a lot of connections come to proxy uh, SQL or even it would come in your MySQL case as well beyond a particular limit that you have set. So there's a parameter called max connections. If the number of client connections exceeds that or is about the same, you'll start getting this error. Solution is that simply bump up this value and it'll be good. General advice is that uh, all the proxy SQL works out of the box kind of, uh, but you'd like to make your refactor app to make it a bit more resilient uh, to handle database connection and operational failure so that it recovers automatically without you needing to restart the app. So what does the end result look like? We had like 5x gains in case of our write. We had, get, we had 10x gains in case of our read. And we have some cost saving as well. We just got rid of our like uh, two out of our four uh, AWS replicas uh, saving around like $1,500 a, a month. And the load is on our master is now less, giving us enough legroom to handle uh, traffic spikes during our peak hours and peak seasons. This is a uh, live stats pulled out from our data metrics dashboard. So you see that uh, uh, the latency is almost the same as before. But on the right hand corner, you see that the connections made to the primary DB has dropped drastically. Initially, that value was like around 1.5K on average value. Uh, and that has come down to around 300, uh, 300. So it's like one fifth. Uh, and that too, it has got the free, uh, like connections which are free in the pool. So it has got connections used and which has got connections free. So the real value will be much lower, but we have over provision proxy SQL anyways. And in case of reads, we had initially uh, uh, four replicas handling around over 1,000 connections each. Uh, now that has come down to around like 400 connections in all. Uh, again, th there is the uh, free connections that are lying idle. And you see that over all these experiments, uh, the latency, uh, the throughput of a database has remained almost same. So, it's, uh, so we have been able to achieve the same performance with maintaining less number of connections to database. So what is in store for Proxy SQL at Zapier in future? So currently we use Django based routing because that was a simple approach to take. We did not need to refactor our code base. But in the future, um, we'd like to try the query based routing of Proxy SQL the way uh, DBS do it, like having a central place where you can configure uh, uh, how your queries are routed to, uh, to your various databases. Proxy SQL also has got a cool query caching feature. It's a very efficient query caching feature, much efficient than MySQL's uh, query caching. However, it's a very simple system. It's a simple TTL based system. So that means that you do not, once the cache is set, you do not have control to invalidate the cache. That will need some refactor in our app if you want to leverage this. But uh, we want to give this a shot in the future. And we have not, till now, we have not uh, tapped into like live updating procedural config. It needs some additional tooling. So in our uh, version one deployment, we just went with kind of immutable deployments. Uh, but in the, uh, in, the, in the upcoming future, we want to implement live updates so that we don't need to restart Proxy SQL at all and uh, keep uh, serving traffic without any errors or downtimes. These are the resources I used uh, for my talk. You can, uh, this link to the Proxy SQL website, you can find the uh, Docker image uh, that you're using to run Proxy SQL, the benchmark source code, and the test uh, demo, uh, test Django app that I built for Proxy SQL. Uh, you can uh, find it on GitHub. So, I'm up for questions. Hi, uh, how, uh, you mentioned that, uh, you know, to, to prevent proxy SQL uh, from being a single point of failure, yeah. you would want to cluster it. So how do you cluster that? Oh, you can have uh, proxy SQL running either in an ASG uh, behind a load balancer, or in our case, actually, I did not delve into the topic of running proxy SQL on Kubernetes. Uh, so that is, there'll be another talk, uh, but you can have multiple proxy SQL uh, running, uh, instances running put an ELB behind that, that will add some latency, but in our experience we saw that the latency is only one to uh, like two milliseconds, which is an acceptable figure for us. 
other thing you can do is that you can have a DNS based load balancing as well like weighted records, but with DNS there's the trade off of TTLs uh, kicking in that you won't have live updates immediately, it will take some time to. Right, but uh, then won't you lose the benefits of connection pooling because uh, connection pooling holds a connection to a particular server. Oh, right? ELB has the ability to keep connections, uh, hold connections for some time. Okay, yeah. thank you. Quick question. Um, you mentioned you are running it in front of uh, AWS uh, RDS instances. Yeah. Uh, does it actually handle um, failovers like multi AG failovers properly? Uh, we have not yet delved into failovers with, uh, with uh, uh, like proxical, but it can do that because with the live configuration update, uh, you just need to update, have some kind of like tooling to just update the config and it will just fail over gracefully. Yeah, so we have not yet delved into that, so I cannot, say, uh, but it is a good area we can explore, yeah. Uh, you mentioned you were doing some this, uh, One minute, uh, uh, I'll just, yeah, I just remember, Proxysical also has got some kind of health checks, so Proxysical can do it for you, yeah, yeah. But we have not implemented, so I was not uh, confident enough to tell that upfront, yeah. Are you doing the Kubernetes scaling or? I cannot hear you. Are you doing the Kubernetes scaling or the EOP? Mode and services or? Yes, uh, Kubernetes services uh, using a service, a load balancer type service, and with a lot of hacks around that. Are you creating an ELB or a ASP? We are creating an ELB because ELB cannot, I think, work for this uh, like non HTTP traffic. We tried NLB, it did not work great for us in the early stages. It might work now. So, yeah. Is it possible to uh, sort of configure two masters and then you know one master sort of taking the traffic and then when the failover happens automatically? We are exploring that. Uh, Proxysical works with uh, setups like Galera cluster as well, which are multi master. So Proxysical has got uh, capacity to like uh, able to write rules to uh, like shard, uh, like uh, send traffic to shards. Uh, but we have not explored into that. So, but it, it does some, uh, support some features like. Uh, like handling shards and all. So it works with multi master setup, but we have not used that. Not, not probably multi master setup, I was probably indicating similar question to what he asked. Are there health checks sort of thing so that, you know, if my primary master fails, automatically traffic gets diverted to the. Yeah, the, it has got health checks. It monitors the backends. So it can do, like, whenever there is some error, it can switch uh, between the backends. So one more follow up question. You mentioned that, uh, uh, you know, when the configuration update happens, all of the uh, connections which are going to the old master will continue happening. Old master, I think any DP, like any backend, yeah. Yeah, so what it does is that it lets the in flight connections complete and then only, uh, and parallelly it starts uh, routing the new connections to the new DB, but it doesn't kill the in flight transactions. But won't that uh, lead to inconsistency? I, I'm not able to. Uh, won't that lead to inconsistency? So that has to be, obviously, yeah, there, there are various challenges, like Proxical won't know about like the inconsistency, that the, you have to orchestrate that how you want to do the failover. But it won't kill your transactions, which you want from the proxy. No questions? So I think I'm done. One question. Um, oh. So we saw the, the previous presentation. Where, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. The previous uh, presentation on the test, could you have used such a solution instead of hook test? Uh, oh, we are considering to use VTS uh, first when we're uh, like exploring solutions. But last year when we started uh, researching on this thing, uh, we're not that confident with running something uh, stateful in VTS, but uh, Jitens talk uh, like cleared some doubts that we can actually run uh, something like that in uh, Kubernetes, like a stateful application. So we just kept VTS away. but. We are considering VTS for other reasons, like uh, other things, in, uh, like just for experiment, yeah. I have a question about uh, the hardware. Uh, for example, uh, can you speak a bit hello? louder? Is it audible? Yeah. Uh, I have a question about hardware. Uh, on, on this, uh, what type of hardware we need to choose for the, uh, this proxy? Like oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, proxy SQL is very CPU intensive. So, in our setup, uh, we are using like uh, we have like six proxical nodes of pods running. They are using around like two uh, two CPU cores each, but it's very light on memory. This is CPU intensive, but less on memory. So you need to uh, get uh, compute intensive nodes. Uh, to are run you it. enabled uh, query cache in proxy? In your environment, are you enabled query cache in proxy? We have not yet enabled query cache, 
because this is the first uh, implementation with proxy sequence. Once you're more confident with that, we'll go it step by step. But it is really efficient that that we have uh, kind of checked function code refactor on our side to do that. There's one question at the back. As well. Hey. Hello. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you said that uh, proxy SQL will uh, figure out whether uh, it will pass your query and figure out whether to send to a replica or to a master. Uh, now, uh, how do you handle stuff like slave lag? How do you handle stuff like? Slave lag, I mean, if you're hitting a slave, how do you ensure that you're getting uh, proper data? So uh, proxy SQL will not magically route your traffic. You have to write uh, query rules for that and it's totally up to you how you want to write the regexs that fits uh, your, uh, like, uh, uh, like how you want to route it. So you can write that something regex like which has like select for update things goes to uh, primary and all select queries goes to uh, uh, database. But in case of I think transactions, it default, it disables multiplexing altogether. So it'll just, uh, it'll send all the queries to a particular uh, master co connection. Hello. Yep. Uh, you mentioned about uh, max scale. Max scale not segregating read and write. Uh, I mean, like I've been using max scale. Max scale segregates read and write. Uh, I think uh, the documentation that I read uh, earlier, it, it, uh, the information might be a bit outdated. So that time when you're uh, evaluating all these services, so it did not uh, like uh, what I read. I might be mistaken, but uh, what I read that time was that it did not have support for query rule segregation. You cannot separate. You, uh, like, can you write query rules to say that you ra route all my select queries on this table to that and uh, insert queries of uh, to a particular table to a particular uh, database? You can? Okay, then, yeah, then. Okay, I got that. <laughs> 